Hello, welcome back scientists. I'm excited that you're joining me again. This is lesson two of the sixth grade Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate Unit. If you haven't watched lesson one, you should go back and do that first because it introduces the investigation question that we're going to be doing throughout this whole unit and it's really important. Okay, so let's get started. The first thing is that you're going to need a couple of things. You're going to need something to write with, something to write on. I have a notebook and a pen that I was using during lesson one. If you have the same notes that you were using then, that's great, pull them out. If not, get some fresh paper, it's fine. You could also use a packet. There are some um, schools that are going to be giving out packets to go along with this lesson, so you could talk to your teacher and ask about getting one of those. Okay, and the most important thing is for you to have someone to talk to. It could be someone in your house that you're actually in the same room with, or if you have a way to get a hold of a friend from your class, either a text or a phone call, and you could watch the lesson together, it's just really helpful to have someone to talk to. That's how scientists do their best work. Okay, let's get started by looking at some data. As you'll remember from lesson one, the question that we're trying to understand is how come the air temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand is colder during El Nino years. The farmers there really want to know why this is happening so they can prepare for it. And so let's just start by getting a little bit of data from the farmers themselves. So this is what we know. We know that the average air temperature in Christchurch, New Zealand during a normal year is represented by this blue bar and during the El Nino year it's represented by the orange bar. So let's just pause a moment and take a look at this graph in a little bit of detail. There is a vertical line that has some data and it mentions that it's in degrees Celsius and each one of those little notches is two degrees Celsius. And then the, the horizontal line is showing the labels for the two bars. The blue bar is the normal year and the orange bar is the El Nino year. So when I look at this graph, I can see pretty clearly that during a normal year, the average temperature is 12 degrees Celsius and during an El Nino year, it's only 11 degrees Celsius, which really doesn't seem like very much. That's only one degree Celsius. So I wonder how much that's really affecting everything. So that's one thing that I kind of wonder about. So on the right side of the screen, it just mentions that El Nino events occur every two to seven years. And there's a shift in the climate across the tropical Pacific, which causes some areas to become cooler than usual and some areas to become warmer than usual. Here, I'll move my picture over there. So that is sort of a definition of what El Nino is, but it's hard for for us when we use Fahrenheit more frequently to understand how cold really is 12 degrees Celsius. Is it like super cold like Antarctica? Is Christchurch, New Zealand like Antarctica? And so having a better understanding of Celsius and Fahrenheit will help. So I have this handy poster which has conversion. So let me pop my screen out a little so you can see. So when we look at this, I'll try to see over the top, you can see right here that 12 degrees Celsius is 50, 53.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So 53 degrees doesn't seem like super warm. When I think about a warm day in Seattle, I would think 75, 80 degrees. That seems nice and warm. But in the winter, temperatures in Seattle can get, you know, down to the 40s on a normal day in like January, February. And so the thing to remember is that this graph, and we'll come back to it, is actually telling us the average. And so remember in our thermal energy unit that we just finished, average takes into account all the different data from all the parts and then um, adds them all together and divides by the number of numbers. And so that 12 degrees Celsius is actually representing every day in January, every day in February, all the months, even July and August. So in some months, the temperature is going to be really high and other months, it's going to be really low. But when we find the average, it's 12 degrees Celsius or about 54 degrees Fahrenheit. Did you see how I rounded that number up just a little bit? So it seems like pretty similar to Seattle weather, actually, because if you average out the warm days in July and August, where we have 80 degree temperature and the cold days in January that we have 40 degrees. It seems like 
54 degrees Celsius. Oh, whoa, that's really hot. 54 degrees Fahrenheit or 12 degrees Celsius is pretty similar. So that's helpful for us to understand. So now we're talking about one degree difference. So if I look at my, my chart again, let me zoom back out so you can see it. If I look over here, I can see that, um, oh, that doesn't really help me a lot. But if you look at the difference between one degree and the next, it doesn't just tell me how many degrees that is. But um, you can see that the difference between one degree Celsius and a degree Fahrenheit is about, it looks like it's about two degrees Fahrenheit. And that's helpful to sort of understand. It's a little different. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of what this graph is showing us, let's talk a little bit about what that means for the energy. Okay, so if we're looking at the, the data, and we're trying to understand how the energy in the air might change as the temperature changes, right? So on the right side of the screen, it says Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual, than usual during El Nino years. This means that the air has blank energy during an El Nino event. So does that mean, okay, so is the temperature going up or down during El Nino? Okay, it's, it's going down during El Nino. My graph really clearly says that. So now this question is asking about the energy. Is the energy going to go up or down? So grab your notes. I'm going to do mine. And just jot down really quick, what, how would you fill in this blank? I'll do the same thing. Okay, what did you write down? I wrote down less. Just like that. And just like it just popped up on the screen. But I might have already known the answer because I was a teacher. So that makes sense. But I, I'm pretty sure you knew the answer too. It makes a lot of sense. Something has less temperature, then it's going to have less energy. So let's fill the blanks in here. Temperature is a measure of energy. Yes, that's right. Air with blank will have higher temperature than air with blank. Okay, so if something has a higher temperature, is it going to have a higher energy? Yes, yes it is. So air with a higher temperature or with more energy will have a higher temperature than air with less energy. Okay, so let's pull this all together. Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual during El Nino years. So that means that we know that the air actually has less energy. And that's an important thing to try to understand. But now the question that we really want to know is how does air get energy? Let's think about that question for a little bit. Okay, so we know that the source of all energy is from the sun, right? And so how does the energy transfer from the sun to earth? So when we think of the word transfer, we know that it's to move one object from, or energy from one place to another place or from one object to another object. And this illustration here of a Newton's cradle is just showing the energy transferring from one sphere ball to the next. And it does it by coming into contact. Okay, so obviously the sun is not in contact with Earth. Thank goodness, because that would be a disaster. But how is the air on our planet getting heated at all? And so what we're going to do is we're going to use two different models to... Let me move my picture right there. That's kind of not in the way. So during this lesson, we're going to use two different models. Scientists have to use models sometimes to... Um, to study something that they can't observe directly. So um, we have two models like i was just mentioning we have the model from the experiment and we have the computer model which we're going to use to collect evidence and so i'll make a video of each one that you can watch but before we get to those two models that we're going to be using to answer the investigation question let's talk a little bit about claims so we have just discussed and we know that the energy that comes to the air has to come from the sun, which is the source of all energy on our earth. And we're going to try to figure out how does the, the air even get heated. Okay, so we understand that the sun is what heats our planet and um, the atmosphere of our planet. So how does it happen? That's what we're trying to figure out. So before we continue on, I just want to take a moment to have you jot down some ideas. So you can either use your notebook, your packet, um, a Schoology discussion or something like that to just record what do you think is happening? Like how does the Earth's atmosphere get heated? So 
um, I want you to pause the video right now and do that before watching the last little bit of lesson two, video one, which is this video that we're watching right now. Okay, so pause the video right now. Okay, welcome back. And I'm gonna show you a couple of claims that I wrote down already. So you can see if some of your ideas might be similar to this. So we have this giant star that's like 150 million kilometers away from Earth or 92 million miles if you aren't quite familiar with the metric system. Although my goal is for you to be able to use the metric system. So the, the first claim, it shows this picture here of our star, the sun, and it is far away, but the energy from the, the sun reaches our planet, and once it does, it starts heating up the molecules in our atmosphere and making them have more energy and therefore a higher temperature. Okay, so that's claim one. Claim two says, uh, claim two is a little bit more complex. Claim two has, um, the energy just passes right through the atmosphere and heats the earth first. And then the earth gets very hot from the energy from the sun. And then that is what's heating the atmosphere above it. And so we're going to set up two experiments, one using, or sorry, two models, one using equipment as an experiment and one as a computer model to collect data to try to see which of these claims is more accurate. So which one do you think is more likely? Like which one of these do you think is um, more in line with what you're thinking? Okay. All right. Thanks for watching video one. I'll see you in video two. Okay, this is exciting. We're going to do an experiment. Okay, so this is lesson two, part two, conducting the experiment. So let's get started. Okay, so we already talked about the investigation question. What we're trying to figure out is how does air get energy? And um, when we ask how air gets energy, what we're really asking about is energy transfer. We want to know how the energy is transferred to the air. So we have these two claims. We have claim one, which is basically saying that energy is transferred from the sun to the air. And we have claim two, that energy is transferred from the sun to the surface, and then from the surface to the air. So in this experiment that we're about to do, because it's a model, each of the parts of the experiment actually represents something else. So in this experiment, we have the sun, which is represented by the lamp. And when the lamp is on, that means it's daytime and the earth is um, receiving energy from the sun. The, the next thing we have is we have the rocks, which represent the surface of the earth. And those are set right on the edge of the table so that the lamp is hanging over we have one side that has um, no surface, and then the other side has a surface which is rep represented by the rocks. And then finally, the last part is, uh, move that, the air represents the air just above Earth's surface. So let's move this up here so we can see the air. We have the air that doesn't have surface below it, and we have the air that does have surface below it. Okay. So. We have the two claims, and claim one says that energy is transferred from the sun to the air. So as the energy travels across space from the sun, once it hits Earth's atmosphere, it begins to transfer energy, and the molecules in the atmosphere start speeding up, getting more kinetic energy, and therefore their temperature begins to increase. So if claim one were true, would you expect the air temperature with no surface, so we're talking about the side that doesn't have a surface, would you expect the temperature there to, to go higher, to go lower, or to stay the same as the air above the surface? So think about what your thoughts are about that. Take a moment to pause the video and record your ideas in your notebook. Um, or on a piece of paper, just to make sure that you kind of have a sense of what you'd expect from claim one. Okay, welcome back. I hope you did pause it. If you didn't pause it for real, pause the video, write down your thoughts, and then hit play again. Okay, so for claim two, if that were true, what would you expect? So claim two is that energy is transferred from the sun to the surface of the earth. 
um, passes right through the atmosphere without, without affecting it at all, and then from the surface to the air. And so if claim two were true, would you expect the air temperature with no surface underneath to be higher, lower, or the same as the air above the surface? So in both times, think about the air with no surface, and what do you think would happen? If claim two is true, then would any energy be transferred to the air with no surface at all? If we look here at the difference here, this is showing the air with no surface and energy would transfer. And with claim two, it doesn't look like this air can transfer. I meant that the energy can transfer to the air. So let's talk about setting up this experiment. Um, in a moment, I'll show you the experiment that I have set up here at my house and show you the equipment. And if you have similar equipment at your house or you can get it, you can set it up. Otherwise, you can watch me and I'll collect the data for us. So we will measure the temperature of the air at two locations and at two times. The first time will be the starting temperature of the air at both locations. And the second time, will be the temperature at both locations after 20 minutes under a lamp. So we're gonna measure the temperature above a surface and above no surface. So this is how I have the experiment set up. I have, um, it's called a ring stand. You don't have to use that, but I have a lamp that's clamped onto the ring stand. And then I've set it, so I've pushed it right to the edge of the table so that the lamp, and I'll show this to you in more detail in a moment, so that the lamp is kind of hanging over the edge like the picture right here is showing, just like this. And then I piled up some rocks on the side to represent the surface of the earth. And then on the other side, um, there's, there's no surface. And then I took two digital thermometers and I set them so they're exactly the same height. So the one that's over the rocks, I had to place on a small box to get it to be at the same height. And the other one, I clamped a ring stand so that I could suspend the thermometer so it, cause it can't float in thin air, as awesome as that would be. And so they're both at the same height. And we want that to be true because then we're measuring the temperature of the air that's the same distance from the lamp. And that thermometer, represents the air in the atmosphere right above the surface and right um, without a surface. Okay, so what you're going to need to do for this part is you're going to need to make a data table. So in your notebook, just quickly make, um, it looks like four columns and three rows. And in the first column, we have um, the starting air temperature, well it's actually like the second column in, but the starting air temperature, that's before the lamp's turned on. In this, the next column we have the final air temperature, which is after the lamp has been on for 20 minutes. And then what we're going to do is we're going to simply do a quick subtraction problem, which is what's the change in the air temperature? So we take the final and we subtract the starting to find out what the change was. Okay, all right, so pause the video right here so that you can create this table and I will move my picture off of here so that you can see the whole thing. And um, once you're done making your table, then turn the video back on and we'll collect some data together. Hi, okay, so I've moved my camera and I'm trying to make the shot so you can see the action which is happening right here. So the first thing we need to do is record the temperature that's right here. And if you kind of, you can kind of see that it's hanging out just above the rocks, but not touching the rocks. Okay, so the temperature for this one, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it on. And I want you to notice that right now it's set at Celsius, which is exactly what we want. And so we're going to place it over here and we're going to record what the temperature is of that. And then this one that's hanging out just above the air it's on. And if I look at that one, I can see that this one, uh-oh, that's set for Fahrenheit. We can't use Celsius and Fahrenheit, so I'm going to switch it so that this one also reads Celsius. Okay, so they've been hanging out here, and because there's no energy that's happening here, they should be the same temperature. Okay. Um, but they're not. They're slightly different. So we'll take that into consideration when we um, do our final um, our final data. 
So the one that's above the surface is currently set at 23.6 degrees Celsius. So in your table, right here where it says air above the surface, that's the starting temperature. That's that first empty box. You're going to write 23.6 degrees Celsius. Okay. The other side says the air with no surface. So this side right here that's just hanging out and there's, there's nothing under here but air, that is set at 22.9 degrees Celsius. Okay, so right now the temperature is a little bit off, but that's okay, that just sometimes happens. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna turn the lamp on. You can see it just got a lot brighter in here. Ooh, that's right on my face. Remember that this represents the sun and we are going to set the timer for 20 minutes and I'm just going to use my cell phone as a timer. So I'll go ahead and hit start and um, there it goes. So we'll come back together in 20 minutes. Okay, my timer is going off. It's been 20 minutes. I'm going to stop it. Okay, so with this here, we have the following data. This is pretty exciting. The thermometer that is over the surface is now reading at 28.0 degrees Celsius. And so you can add that right here. This is the air above the surface. The second column is 28.0 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then the air with um, this over here, where there's nothing below this, the table just drops off. You can kind of see that. I'll move it over so you can see that there's nothing down here. It's just air. That one is reading, it actually increased a little too. It's reading at 26.4 degrees Celsius. Okay, now that we've collected our data, let's, um, let's take a look at it together. Let's sort of analyze it. So we see that both of um, the different setups, that the temperature did increase. With um, the air above the surface, the temperature increased by 4.4 degrees Celsius. And with the air that had no surface underneath, the temperature increased by 3.5 degrees Celsius. So although they both increased, the air above the surface increased by almost an entire degree Celsius more than the air with no surface. So we're going to want to collect more evidence from the sim to, to come up with our final ideas. But before we do that part, let's just take a moment to, um, to have a couple of discussion questions. So you can write down your answers to these questions in your notebook. You can turn and talk to the person that you're doing this lesson with either because they're in the room with you or because you're on the phone or texting them or your teacher might ask you to respond to these questions on um, online or in a Schoology page. So question one, what happened in the experiment? Question two, did the results support claim one or claim two? And what did you learn from the experiment that might help you answer the question we're trying to investigate, which is how does air even get energy? All right, so you can pause the video on this screen so that you can answer the questions and I'll meet you in lesson two, part three. Welcome back scientists. I'm excited that you're joining me again. This is part three of lesson two. If you haven't already watched part one and two of lesson two, you should go back and watch those first because they are very important to what we'll be talking about. The title for this part of the lesson is Gathering Evidence from the Sim. So previously we looked at this picture that shows two claims. Claim one, which is that energy is transferred from the sun directly to the air, and claim two, which says energy is transferred from the sun to the surface and then to the air. Both claim one and two are trying to answer the question of how does air get energy, right? Um, so our SIM investigation that we'll do right now will help us to determine which claim is more convincing. 
Okay, so in this part of the lesson, there are three things that, that we need to do. One, we need to make a prediction and we need to make observations, that's the second thing. And then finally, we need to use our new evidence that we're gonna gather from the sim to support our claim. What do you think will happen to the air after being heated for one minute? With a surface and with no surface. So you can make your prediction in your notebook. You could also just tell the person that you're doing this lesson with, a friend or someone who's at your house, you can jot your ideas down or just say them. And then you're gonna make some observations and my directions are just observe and record the results of your exploration. Did the temperature increase, decrease, or stay the same? And then finally, we'll take that and we'll write down in our science notebook which claim we think is best supported by the evidence that we've collected. So here's a data table that you can use to record your observations in your science notebook. There's a place for you to record the starting temperature, the final air temperature, and then you can subtract those to find the change. And pause it for just a moment if you need to, so that you can create this data table in your science notebook. You don't have to use a ruler or anything like that. You can just write it down. Okay, so the video, pause it now, and I'm going to keep going so that when you come back from unpaused, it's ready to go. Okay, so... Throughout this unit, we're going to be using the Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate Sim to help us learn more about why Christchurch, New Zealand's air temperature is cooler than usual during El Nino years. So simulations are scientific models that scientists often use to make observations of things that they can't observe directly. There are a lot of things happening on Earth, and but the planet is so large we can't easily observe everything or measure them. And so although this model that we're going to be using isn't um, exactly like real life, we can use it to study what's actually happening as heat is moving around our planet on Earth. Okay, so to get to the sim, you'll log on to your Amplify account the way you would normally do that, um, going through Clever and then getting on. And then once you're there, click on the Oceans, Atmosphere, and Climate sim that looks like this with some, you know, water moving around past this continent. And once you open that up, you're going to open up the, the surface test model. So let's do a little preview. The surface test model looks like this, and there's something that I want you to notice right away, which is that as soon as it starts, it just starts going. And so the first thing I always like to do when I open it up is I first hit the pause button, which will be right here, right here, this is the play button. And so you're going to hit the pause button and then just quickly hit this to reload it. And the default is to start with medium solar output. Let's leave it at that. That sounds perfect. And we only need to let this sim run for about one minute before we'll have enough evidence to support one or two, claim one or two. Okay, so if you have access to the sim, I would say stop this video right now go open it up and check it out and then come back and join us. If you don't have access to the sim, just stay on with me and I'll go ahead and walk you through it and we can record some evidence um, together. Okay, this is the sim and I've already moved it to the surface test and I have hit pause and then I reloaded it. So now everything's ready to go and You'll notice right away that the starting temperature of the air temperature above the surface is negative 10 degrees Celsius. So take a moment to record that. And then I'm going to switch to the no surface mode. And if I do that, the surface disappears. And you'll notice with this one that the air temperature is also negative 10 degrees Celsius. So record that. So now that I have my two starting points, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So we're gonna start with the surface. And let's just hit play. And to speed it up, I'm going to go ahead and move it to times two. So it goes really, really fast. And when I look at this, I notice a couple of things right away, which is that the air temperature is increasing. And I'm going to stop it there. I think that was only about 30 seconds or so. But definitely we're seeing like an increase in the air temperature. So I'm going to record that my final air temperature, and you can write this down too. I'm just going to type it in my computer, is 18.6 degrees Celsius. 
Okay, so now let's switch over to the no surface. And again, you'll notice that it is starting at negative 10 degrees Celsius. Okay, and now I'm going to hit play. And guys, I did hit play. Is the temperature changing at all? I mean, it's not. You can see that it doesn't seem to be changing at all. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and hit pause now because I see that there isn't really any changes happening at all. Okay, so let's take a look at our results. So let's spend a little bit of time analyzing our results. This kind of math is a little bit tricky, so I am going to switch hats and be a math teacher for just a moment to help us understand subtracting negative numbers. Negative 10 degrees Celsius is actually 10 numbers below zero. So to find the difference between a positive number, you actually have to go up 10 degrees just to get to zero. And then after that point, when you're at zero, you go up an additional 18.6 degrees. So the total change in our system is 28.6 degrees Celsius, which is actually quite a lot. With the air that had no surface, we had the same starting temperature and the same ending temperature in our computer model. We have a change in air temperature there of just zero degrees Celsius. So using this data, I want you to take a look at claim one a second time. Claim one has the picture where energy from the sun is heating the, the air directly. So considering how air gets energy, do you agree or disagree with this statement? The sun warms the air directly. So I would like for you to turn and talk to the person that you're watching this video with, whether it's a friend that you have gotten on your phone or someone in your home and just tell them what do you think do you agree with this or do you disagree with this and what sort of evidence supports your idea so pause the video for a moment share your ideas okay welcome back scientists the heating experiment and the sim both showed that when there is no surface the air temperature does not increase as much in our experiment that we had set up, we saw a small difference in the temperature with no surface and the one that had a surface. The sim showed that energy transfers from the sun to the surface first and then from the surface to the air. So this means that energy does not transfer directly from the sun to the air. This is an exciting moment because this is our very first key concept for our unit. And I hope that you're as excited as this girl is because this is an exciting moment. So the first key concept for this unit, and I absolutely think you should write this down in your notes, is energy from the sun is transferred to Earth's surface. Some of that energy is then transferred to the air above the surface. This is, this is so cool because what it shows is that energy from our star that's 150 million kilometers away just passes straight through the atmosphere to Earth, hits the surface of the Earth, and it starts to warm the surface of the Earth. And then the blanket of air that's around our planet is in direct contact with the Earth. And as the Earth gets warmer and warmer and warmer, energy transfers from the Earth's surface to the air. And that is so cool. Okay, this is the end of lesson two. And in lesson three, we have an exciting thing to discover together about how where you are on Earth could affect how much energy you're actually getting from the sun and how that's gonna warm the air.